Okay. You live? Okay. You live? All right. Okay. Next, we have Jernigan Bachman. And Jernigan is setting up our own Ben Bachman who works here. And he's going to sing for us. Uh, yes. Does anybody know what that is? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was almost Christmas time, and there I stood in another line, trying to buy that last gift or two, not really in the Christmas mood. Standing right in front of me was a little boy waiting anxiously, pacing around like little boys do, and in his hands he held a pair of shoes. And his clothes were worn and old. He was dirty from head to toe. And when it came his time to pay, I couldn't believe what I heard him say. Sir, I want to buy these shoes for my mama, please. It's Christmas Eve and these shoes are just her size. Could you hurry, sir? Daddy says there's not much time. You see, she's been sick for quite a while. And I know these shoes will make her smile. And I want her to look beautiful. If mama means Jesus tonight. They counted pennies for what seemed like years. Then the cashier said, son, there's not enough here. He searched his pockets frantically. And then he turned and he looked at me. He said, mama made Christmas good at our house. Though most years she just did without. Tell me, sir, what am I going to do? Somehow I have to buy her these Christmas shoes. So I laid the money down, I just had to help him out. And I'll never forget the look on his face when he said, Mama's gonna look so great. Sir, I wanna buy these shoes for my mama, please. It's Christmas Eve and these shoes are just her size. Could you hurry, sir? Daddy says there's not much time. You see, she's been sick for quite a while. And I know these shoes will make her smile. And I want her to look beautiful. If mama meets Jesus tonight. I knew I caught a glimpse of heaven's love as he thanked me and ran out. I knew that God had sent that little boy to remind me what Christmas is all about. Sir, I want to buy these shoes for my mama, please. It's Christmas Eve and these shoes are just her size. Could you hurry, sir? Daddy says there's not much time. You see, she's been sick for quite a while. And I know these shoes will make her smile. I want her to look beautiful. If Mama meets Jesus tonight, I want her to Mama meets Jesus tonight. Thank you. Thank you.
Lisa works uh, with the Sequoia Regional Library. She works in technical processing. She's the one that helps <coughs> get your books ready and puts them in the catalog. So we're glad to have them here with us tonight. Good evening. This evening we'll be reading uh, Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. Imagine a morning in late November, a coming of winter morning more than 20 years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature. But there's also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it. Just today, the fireplace commenced its seasonal roar. A woman in the shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She is wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She is small and sprightly like a bantam hen, but due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable, not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that, and tinted by sun and wind, but it's delicate too finely boned, and her eyes are sherry-colored and timid. Oh, my! She exclaims, her breath smoking the window pane. It's fruitcake weather! <laughs> the person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven. She is sixty-something. We are cousins, very distant ones, and we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives. And though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not on the whole too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy in memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other Buddy died in the 1880s when she was still a child, and she is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed, she says, turning away from the window with a purposeful excitement in her eyes. Oh, the courthouse bell sounded so cold and clear, and there were no birds singing. They've gone to warmer country, yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuit and fetch our buggy. Help me by my hat. Oh, we got 30 cakes to bake. <laughs> It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that accelerates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces... It's fruitcake weather! Fetch my buggy and find my hat! <laughs> the hat is found. A straw cartwheel corsaged with velvet roses out of doors has faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together we guide our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine, and that is, it was bought for me when I was born. It is made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But it is a faithful object. Spring times we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild fern for our porch pots. In the summer, we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugar cane fishing poles and roll it down to the edge of a creek. It has its winter use, too, uh, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen, as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier, who has survived distemper and two rattlesnake fights. Queenie is trotting beside it now. Three hours later, we are back in the kitchen hauling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. Oh, our backs hurt from gathering them. How hard they were to find. The main crop having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us. Among the concealing leaves, the frosted deceiving grass crackle, a cheery crunch Scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse, and the golden mound of sweet, oily, ivory meat melts in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now and again my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. Oh, we mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop. And there's scarcely enough as there is for the cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror. 
Our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final haul into the fire and with joined sighs watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty, the bowl is brimming full. We eat our supper, cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow is the kind of work I like best begins. Buying cherries and citron, ginger and vanilla, and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins, walnuts and whiskey, and oh, so much flour, butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings, why well, we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any, except for the skin flint sums persons in the house occasionally provide. A dime is considered big money, or what we earn ourselves from various activities. Holding rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries, jars of homemade jam and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings. Once we won 79th prize, $5, in a national football contest. Oh, not that we know a fool thing about football. It's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested AM, and after some hesitation, for my friend thought it perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan, AM, Amen. <laughs> To tell the truth, our only real profitable enterprise was the Fun and Freak Museum we conducted in a backyard tool shed two summers ago. The Fun was a stereo opticon with slide views of Washington and New York lent to us by a relative who had been to those places. She was furious when she discovered why we had borrowed it. The Freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody here about to want to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups a nickel and kids two cents. It took in a good twenty dollars before the museum shut down due to the decease of the main attraction. <laughs> but one way and another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse, under a loose board, under the floor, under the chamber pot, under my friend's bed. The purse is seldom removed from this safe location except to make a deposit or, as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I am allowed 10 cents to go to the picture show. My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way I can imagine it more. Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from her home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except funny papers and the Bible, worn costumes, cursed, wished someone hard, harm, told a lie on purpose, let a hungry, hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done, does do. Killed with a hoe the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this country. Sixteen rattles. Dip snuff. Secretly. Tame hummingbirds. Just try it. Uh, so they balance on her finger. Tell ghost stories. We both believe in ghosts. So tingling they chill you in July. Talk to herself. Take walks in the rain. Grow the prettiest japonicas in town. Know the recipe for every sort of old-time Indian cure, including a magical Indian wart remover. Now, with supper finished, we retire to the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt-covered iron bed, painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently, wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills tightly rolled in green as May buds. Somber 50 cent pieces heavy enough to weigh down a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters 
worn smooth as creek pebbles. But mostly a hateful heap of bitter odored pennies. Last summer, others in the house contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August. The flies that flew to heaven. Yet it was not work we took pride in, and as we sit counting pennies, it is as though we are back tabulating dead flies. <laughs> Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, and then start again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. Oh, I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with the tea. The cakes will fall or put somebody in a cemetery. Well, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13s in bed. So to be on the safe side, we subtract the penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into the fruit cakes, whiskey is the most expensive as well as the hardest to obtain. State law forbids its sale. But everybody knows that you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. And the next day, having completed our more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Ha Ha's business address. A sinful. To quote public opinion. Fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've never been there before. And on the same errand in previous years, our dealings have been with Ha Ha's wife, an iodine, dark Indian woman with brassy peroxide and air and a dead, tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard that he's an Indian too, a giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him Ha Ha because he's so gloomy, a man who never laughs. As we approach this cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish gay naked light bulbs, and standing by the river's muddy edge under the shade of river trees where moss drifts through the branches like gray mist, our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in a hot house cafe, cut to pieces, hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these goings on happen at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns on the big troll of whales. In the daytime, the ha ha's is shabby and deserted. I knock at the door. Queenie barks. My friend calls. Mrs. Ha ha, ma'am, anyone to hold? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts overturn. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself, and he is a giant. He does have scars. He doesn't smile. No, he glowers at us through Satan tilted eyes and demands to know what do you want with Ha Ha. For a moment, we're too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a whispery voice at best. If you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like the quart of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt even more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing too. Which one of you is the drinking man? <laughs> oh, God. It's for making fruitcakes, Mr. Ha Ha. Cooking? That's it. This sobers him. He frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadowed cafe and seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, Two dollars. We pay him with nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, as he jangles the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Tell you what. He proposes pouring the money back into our bead purse. Just send me one of them fruit cakes instead. Well, my friend remarks on our way home. There's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisin in his cake. The black stove, stoked with coal and firewood, glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beaters whirl, spoons spin round in bowls of butter and sugar, vanilla, 
sweetens the air, ginger spices it, melting nose, tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house, drift out to the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days, our work is done. 31 cakes dampened with whiskey, bask on windowsills and shelves. Who, Who are, are they for? for? Friends, not necessarily neighbor friends. Indeed, the larger share is intended for persons we've never met, or we've met maybe once, perhaps not at all. People who struck a fancy. Like President Roosevelt. Like the Reverend and Mrs. J.C. Lucy, the Baptist missionaries to Borneo, who lectured here last winter. Or the little knife grinder who comes through town twice a year. Or Abner Packer, the driver of the 6 o'clock bus from Mobile, who exchanges waves with us every day as he passes in a dust cloud whoosh. Or the young wisdom. A California couple whose car one afternoon broke down outside the house and spent a pleasant hour chatting with us on the porch. Young Mr. Wisdom snapped our picture, uh, the only one we've ever had taken. Is it because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers and nearest acquaintances seem to us our truest friends? I think yes. Also, the scrapbooks we keep of thank yous on White House stationery, time to time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinders' penny postcards make us feel connected to eventful worlds beyond the kitchen with its view of a sky that stops. Now, a new December fig branch grates against the window. The kitchen is empty, the cakes are gone. Yesterday, we carted off the last of them to the post office where the cost of stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me, but my friend insists on celebrating with two inches of whiskey left in Ha Ha's bottle. Queenie has a spoonful and a bowl of coffee. She likes her coffee chicory flavored and strong. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. <laughs> the taste of it brings screwed up expressions and sour shudders. But by and by, we begin to sing. The two of us singing different songs simultaneously. <laughs> I don't know the words to mine, just come on along, come on along to the dark town stutters ball. But I can dance, and that's what I mean to be, a tap dancer in the movies. My dancing shadow rollicks on the walls. Our voices rock the chinaware. Oh, we giggle as if unseen hands were tickling us. Queenie rolls on her back, her paws plow the air, and something like a grin stretches her black lips. Inside myself, I feel warm and sparky as those crumbling logs, carefree as the wind in the chimney. My friend waltzes round the stove, the hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a party dress. Show me the way to go home. She sings, her tennis shoes squeaking on the floor. Show me the way to go home. Enter two relatives. Very angry, potent with eyes that scold, tongues that scald. Listen to what they have to say, the words tumbling together into a wrathful tune. A child of seven, whiskey on his breath. Are you out of your mind, feeding a child of seven? Must be loony. Road and ruination. Oh, remember Cousin Kay? Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law. Shame, oh scandal, humiliation. Kneel, pray, and beg the Lord. Queenie sneaks under the stove. My friend gazes at her, her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt, blows her nose, and runs into her room. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent, except for the chimings of clocks and the sputter of fading fires, she is weeping into a room already as wet as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry. I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering despite my flannel nightgown that smells of last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry. I beg, teasing her toes and tickling her feet. You're too old for that. It's because she hiccups. I am too old. Old and funny. Not funny. Fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop 
crying. You'll be so tired tomorrow. We can't go cut a tree. She straightens up. Queenie jumps on the bed where Queenie's not allowed to lick her cheeks. I know where we'll find real pretty trees, buddy, and holly, too, with fairies as big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, farther than we've ever been. Papa used to bring us Christmas trees from there, carry them on his shoulder. That's 50 years ago. Well, now, I can't wait for morning. <coughs> morning. <clears throat> Frozen rind lusters the grass. Sun. Round as an orange, and orange as hot weather moons, balances on the horizon, burnishes the silver winter woods. A wild turkey calls. A renegade hog grunts in the undergrowth. Soon, by the edge of knee-deep, rapid-running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie wades the stream first, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current, the pneumonia making coldness of it. We follow holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet, a burlap sack, above our heads, a mile more of chastising thorns, burrs and briars that catch at our clothes. Of rusty pine needles, brilliant with gaudy fungus and molted feathers. Here, there, a flash, a flutter, an ecstasy of shrillings remind us that not all the birds have flown south. Always the path unwinds through lemony sun pools and pitch black vine tunnels. Another creek to cross. A disturbed armada of speckled trout froths the water around us and frogs the size of plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are working on a dam. On the far shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold but with enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine-heavy air. We're almost there. Can you smell it, buddy? She says as though we were approaching an ocean, and indeed it is a kind of ocean. Scented acres of holiday trees, prickly-leafed holly, red berries, shiny as Chinese bells, black crows swoop upon them screaming. Having stuffed our burlap sacks with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows, we set about choosing a tree. It should be, she muses my friend, twice as tall as a boy so the boy can't steal the stall. <laughs> we pick one twice as tall as me, a brave, handsome brute that survives 30 hatchet strokes before it keels with a creaking, rending cry. Lugging it like a kill, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, sit down, and pant. But we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen. That and the tree's virile, icy perfume revive us, goad us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town. But my friend is sly and non-committal when passers-by praise the treasure perched in our buggy. What a fine tree, and where did it come from? Yonder way, she murmurs vaguely. Once a car stops, and the rich mill owner's lazy wife leans out and whines. Give ya two bits cash for that old tree. Now, ordinarily, my friend is afraid of saying no, but on this occasion, she promptly shakes her head. We wouldn't take a dollar. The mill wife's owner persists. A dollar my foot, 50 cents, that's my last offer. Goodness woman, you could get another one. In answer, my friend gently reflects. Well, I doubt it, there's never a two of anything. Home. Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps till tomorrow, snorting as loud as a human. A trunk in the attic contains a shoebox of urban tales of the opera cape of a curious lady who once rented a room in the house. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age, one silver star, a brief rope of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous candy-like light bulbs. Excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. My friend wants our tree to blaze. Like a baptist window. Drew with weighty snows of ornaments but we can't afford the Made in Japan splendors at the Five and Dime, so we do what we've always done. Sit for days at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and stacks of colored paper. I make sketches and my friend cuts them out. Lots of cats, fish too, because they're easy to draw. 
Some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels devised from saved up sheets of Hershey bar tin foil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to our tree. As a final touch, we sprinkle the branches with shredded cotton, picked in August for this purpose. My friend, surveying the effect, clasps her hands together. Now, honest buddy, doesn't it look good enough to eat? We need tries to eat an angel. After weaving and ribboning holly rings for all the front windows, our next project is the fashioning of family gifts. Tie-dyed scarves for the ladies. For the men, a home-brewed lemon and licorice and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first symptoms of a cold and after hunting. But when it comes time for making each other's gift, my friend and I separate to work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl-handled knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries. We tasted some once, and she always swears. I could live on them, buddy, Lord. Yes, I could. That's not taking the Lord's name in vain. Instead, I am building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She said so um, on a million occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want. But confound it, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. Only one of these days I will, buddy. Locate you a box. Don't ask me how. Steal it, maybe. Instead, I'm fairly sure, certain that she is building me a kite. The same as last year and the year before. Well, the year before that, we exchanged slingshots. <laughs> Which is fine by me, for we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend, more accomplished than I, can get a flight aloft when there isn't enough breeze to carry clouds. Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butchers to buy Queenie's traditional gift, a good novel beef bone. The bone, wrapped in funny papers, is placed high in the tree near the silver star. Oh, Queenie knows it's there. She squats at the foot of the tree, staring up in a trance of greed. When bedtime arrives, she refuses to bulge. Her excitement is equaled by my own. I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a scorching summer's night. Somewhere a rooster crows, falsely, for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, are you awake? It is my friend calling from her room, which is next to mine. And an instant later, she's sitting on my bed holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep a hooch. <laughs> my mind's jumping like a jackrabbit. <laughs> Buddy, do you think Mrs. Roosevelt will sit about kick his dead up? We hug her in the bed, and she squeezes my hand. I love you. Oh, seems like your hand used to be so much smaller. I guess I hate to see you grow up. When you're grown up, will we still be friends? I say always. But I feel so bad, buddy. I wanted to give you advice. I tried to sell my cameo Papa gave me, buddy. She hesitates as though embarrassed. I made you another kite. Then I confess that I made her one too, and we laugh. The candle burns too short to hold. Out it goes, exposing the starlight. The stars spinning at the window like a visible caroling that slowly, slowly, they break silences. Possibly we doze, but the beginnings of dawn splashes like cold water. We're up, wide-eyed and wandering while we wait for others to waken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops a kettle on the kitchen floor. I tap dance in front of closed doors. One by one, the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both, but it's Christmas so they can't. First, a uh, glorious breakfast, just everything you can imagine from flapjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the comb, which puts everybody in a good humor except my friend and me. Frankly, we're so impatient to get at the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. Who wouldn't be? With socks, a Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, and a year's subscription to a religious magazine for children, The Little Shepherd. It makes me boil, it really does. My friend has a better haul, a stack of Satsumas. Uh, that's her best present. She is proudest, however, of a white wool shawl knitted by her married sister. But she says her favorite gift is the kite I built her. And it, and it is very beautiful, though not as beautiful as the one she made me, which is blue and scattered with gold and green good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is painted on it, Buddy. Buddy, the wind is blowing. 
The wind is blowing, and nothing will do till we run to the pasture below the house where Queenie has scooted to bury her bone. And where a winter hence, Queenie will be buried too. There, plunging through the healthy waist-high grass, we unreel our kites, feel them twitching at the string like skyfish as they swim into the wind. Satisfied, sun warm, we sprawl in the grass and peel satsumas and watch our kites go forward. Soon, I forget the socks and the hand-me-down sweater. I'm as happy as if we'd already won the $50,000 grand prize in the coffee naming contest. My, how foolish I am. My friend cries, suddenly an alert, like a woman remembering too late she has biscuits in the oven. You know what I've always thought. She asks in a tone of discovery and not smiling at me, but at a point beyond. I've always thought a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagined that when he came, it would be like looking at the Baptist window. Pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through. Such a shine, you don't know it's getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think of that shine taking away all the spooky feelings. But I'll wager it never happens. I'll wager at the very end, the body realizes the Lord has already shown himself. The things as they are. Her hand circles in a gesture and gathers clouds and heights and grass and queen pawing the earth over her. Daddy. Just what they've always seen was seeing him. As for me, I believe the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school and so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, grim, reveille ridden summer camps. I have a new home, too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, alone with Queenie. And alone. Buddy, dear. She writes in her wild, hard-to-read script. Yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture where she could be with all her bones. For a few November, she continues to bake her fruitcake single-handed. Not as many, but some. And of course, she always sends me the best of the batch. Also, in every letter, she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show, write me the story. But gradually, in her letters, she tends to confuse me with the other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more, 13ths are the only days she spends in bed. The morning arrives in November, a leafless, birdless coming of winter morning when she cannot rouse herself to explain. Oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when that happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received severing from me an irreplaceable part of myself, letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. That This is why, walking across a school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky, as if I expected to see, rather like parts, a lost pair of kites hurrying towards heaven. Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. 
Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. Fixin' and blitzin' and all his neighbors are pulling on the reins. Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright. Hang your stockings and say your prayers to Santa Claus comes tonight. Let's do that again. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. Fixin' and blitzin' and all his neighbors are pulling on the reins. Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright. So hang your stockings and say your prayers to Santa Claus comes tonight. Now we're going to do another verse. Um, but it's similar. But uh, I didn't make copies for everybody, so you have to sing along. <laughs> here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. He's got a bag that's filled with toys for boys and girls again. Hear those sleigh bells jingle jangle, what a beautiful sight. So jump in bed and hey, so Santa Claus comes in. See, I told you I was rusty. My gosh, I think it's these glasses. I'm playing the glasses. Okay, let's go through all the way through and uh, and we'll, we'll give it a whirl here. Okay, here comes Santa Claus. And then Vixen and Blitz and all those reindeers are pulling on the reins. Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright. So hang your stockings and say your prayers because Santa Claus is coming tonight. I got a bad habit of putting words in there that aren't there, but that's all right. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. Vixen and Blitz and all his reindeers are pulling on the reins. Bells are ringing, children singing, all is merry and bright. So hang your stockings and say your prayers to Santa Claus come tonight. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. He's got a bag that's filled with toys for boys and girls again. Here goes sleigh bells jingle jangle, what a beautiful sight. Jump in bed and cover your head to Santa Claus come tonight. We have a little time. Um, okay, we're going to do Jingle Bells next because it's kind of the same, same melody. Who knows Jingle Bells? Everybody. Everybody's got to know Jingle Bells. Okay, most everyone. Okay. That's kind of low. Let's change the key here. Dashing through the snow, in the horse open sleigh, all the fields we go, laughing all the way, ha ha ha, bells on Bartlett's way, making spirits bright, what fun it is to ride and sing a sleigh song tonight, oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way, oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh, hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse up this sleigh. This is a one verse song. I didn't even print out the other verse. A day or two ago, I thought I'd take a ride. Does anybody know that other verse? Yes. Okay, well, let's try the other verse. What we're going to do is go through this one more time, and then we'll sing the second verse without any pause. Dashing through the snow, in one horse up this sleigh. All the things we go. Laughing all the way, ha ha ha, bells on my bed, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleigh song tonight. Well, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh.
Okay, now we're going to do something a little bit more familiar to me personally, but uh, we're going to do Joy to the World. Everybody know that one pretty much? How many years ago? All right. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And then let nature sing. And then let nature sing. Oh, and 